Okay. Hey everybody, Ned Canty, General Director of Opera Memphis, uh, coming to you at the end of day six of La Boheme rehearsal. Uh, we spent all day today working on Act Two. Uh, it's our third session on Act Two. Uh, act Two is the shortest act uh, in the opera, but it's usually the one that takes the most rehearsal. There's just so much going on, and you, know, you have to find that balance between everything landing exactly where it needs to be, uh, everybody being in the right place at the right time, whether it's to talk to Parpignol or have the bottle of wine or the roasted capon on the table at the right time. So there's a million little details, yet at the same time you want to keep enough uh, organic life and spontaneity for it to really feel like uh, this chaotic uh, uh, this chaotic scene in the Latin Quarter on, on Christmas Eve. Uh, so we're getting there. Uh, I'm fortunate to have uh, an excellent cast who knows a lot of these details, so if something isn't there, uh, often they can either make it happen or make sure it happens the next time uh, without too much guidance. And the chorus of Opera Memphis, which you know, really is the finest chorus in the country, they really are. They, uh, they're able to bring life, they're able to make sure that uh, no matter what's happening on stage, uh, musically or not musically, there's always life there. So if there's a big scene happening in the middle and you happen to glance way over to one side where you've got a couple of choristers selling shoes or whatever in the scene, uh, they always have some interior your life going on. They're not just standing there. Uh, and But they're not doing it in such a way as to pull focus. They're not uh, detracting from what's going on. So it's a, a very special skill that they have. Uh, and several of them, I would give them something very simple to do, like write a note to someone, and they've come up with entire uh, backstories and whatnot. Uh, Donna York, one of our choristers, uh, turned, you know, sit here and wait for your new boyfriend into a whole thing about being widowed. And, you know, by the end of it, he was late because he was rescuing a carriage full of orphans from drowning. It was it was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's it's the kind of life that you know no one in the audience might ever know how much work and thought and effort goes into making some uh, a chorister's life feel full. Uh, but it's a lot. You know, they need to. It needs to seem as if every one of them, if the camera, so to speak, followed any one of those choristers off the stage, their lives would be as compelling as anything that we're seeing happening in the lives of Mimi and Musetta and Marcello, etc. Uh, and these guys really nail that. Uh, of course, the highlight of Act Two is uh, Musetta and Marcello, and trying to figure out that relationship, nail down that relationship, it's, uh, it's always a lot of fun. The, the interesting thing to me about it is that this is a relationship in transition. You know, these are, this is a couple who've been on again, off again. Uh, you know, they break up and Musetta dates some sugar daddy for a while and then gets tired of and ends up back with Marcello. But what's interesting with both of them is that, uh, you know, the other one is the only member of the opposite sex to make them act crazy, to make them act in that way. So uh, for Musetta, she never goes back to a lover once she's done with them, except Marcello. He's always the one that she comes back to. He's sort of home for her. Uh, and same thing with Marcello. And no woman does drives him crazy the way Musetta does. What's interesting about Act Two is that I think it represents the beginning of a big change. And so, because when they get back together again, it's not the same kind of, you know, crazy, mad, uh, youthful, stay up all night partying kind of relationship. They actually try to be grown up when they move into Act Three. They've moved out of the heart of Paris. They're, uh, they have real jobs. They're putting away a little bit of money. Maybe they're gonna buy a house together. And so trying to make sure that the reunion they have in Act Two doesn't feel the same as one they might have had, you know, a year before the opera actually began, that there's something about it that is different and more important. And I do think it's about uh, Marcello, especially being ready to grow up a little bit. And I've got, uh, I won't read the whole thing, but I've got just a, a little quote here from uh, from the, the stories uh, by Roger, the La Vie de Bohème. Uh, this uh, would have taken place in what is our Act Four, uh, but it sort of gives you some insight into Marcello's uh, uh, thinking. Um, so, for my part, I have had enough of it. Poetry does not alone exist in disorderly living, touch-and-go happiness, loves that last as long as a bedroom candle, more or less eccentric revolts against those prejudices which will eternally rule the world, for it is easier to upset a dynasty than a custom, however ridiculous it may be. It is not enough to wear a summer coat in December to have talent. One can be a real poet or artist while going about well-shod and eating three meals a day. Uh, there's a lot more in there, and, and uh, uh, we'll probably talk about it, and I'll uh, maybe read more of the quote once we get into Act 4 and are talking about it. But, you know, to me, it's clear that Marcello is sort of done. Uh, you know, Merger talks about the idea of 
bohemia as being a phase. You know, it's something that you go through in your youth. Uh, and in the end, you either give up being an artist and you go and become a greengrocer or a lawyer or whatever, or uh, you find some measure of success. You start getting hired, you start selling your work, whatever the case may be. Uh, and Marcello is, is at that point, as I think is Rodolfo, as I've already spoken about a little bit, where something needs to change, something needs to give. Uh, it's just not enough anymore. So uh, we'll talk more about that when we get further into the piece into Act 3 and Act 4, but really today with Marcello and Musetta, it's about setting up this, uh, this pattern of behavior and then showing why this pattern of behavior needs to change uh, for both of them and making sure that this time when it reaches its, uh, uh, you know, its apex, that it feels different than other times it might have done that. So, uh, so that was our, uh, uh, our day six of Bohem. Uh, we have the day off tomorrow, so I probably won't be posting a video, but once we get back uh, on Monday, we're going to be starting work on Act 3, just starting to get into that a little bit. A uh, very, very different act. I said today, if only uh, this were a, a two-act show and the curtain came down after the uh, Latin Quarter, it would be the best romance ever. <laughs> so uh, on Monday we get into Act 3 and it's not quite as fun and romantic anymore. Anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, the video, and if you enjoy them, if you find them insightful, uh, tell your friends, send a link, uh, tell them to watch. Uh, we would love to have them. Thanks so much. Oh, and they should probably come and see Bohem if they're in Memphis. Thanks, and have a great night.